Hey, lovely freaks, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda. And I'm Corey. <laughs> um, yeah, so Hannah's not here today. She'll be back next week, uh, but my husband's here with me. And yeah, sorry that we're just getting this out to you guys on Monday. It was a long weekend, so whatever. But um, this is the second part of the Ed Kemper saga. So my husband doesn't really know what happened in the first part, but I'll kind of briefly go over it anyways. Um, Not a lot. Obviously, y'all know that if if you listened to part one. If you didn't, you should go listen to it because there's some interesting stuff. We started out with his life as a child and then the murders that he committed when he was 15 and all that. So he's just a crazy person. He kills yeah. people. Okay. Yeah, so he's a serial <laughs> killer. Um, actually, you know you know, Mindhunter? We watched that show. Mm-hmm. You know the guy that has the glasses? Yeah. The big guy? That's who this is. Okay. So, um, also in part one, he killed his grandparents, went to a mental institution, and then pretty much was able to like make the psychiatrist and psychologist believe that he was all better and that's how he got out um he also got his record expunged and we'll talk about that in this as well Uh, we talked about it last time too real quick though i wanted to say down in the description box you'll see a link that will take you to all of our social media as always, um, Twitter and Instagram, and you should follow us on there because we post a lot of different stuff there. We also will have a link to, it, there'll be various charities that I'm going to post down below for um, the people in Florida. They're still really struggling from Hurricane Ian. Um, it hit them pretty bad. I know that Pine Island and, and Sanibel Island, like Pine Island definitely doesn't have any infrastructure left. Um Meaning, like, they don't have any running water, electricity, etc. And they don't know when it'll be back up. Could be six months, could be a year. So, it definitely devastated um, lots of Florida. Even on the East Coast, um, in Orlando, they had flooding. And then um, St. George, uh, St. Augustine, which we've been there on vacation for, they it flooded the whole historical downtown. So, I'll be posting some links where you can donate money to various charities to help out. And, um... Yeah, so make sure you do that. Also, on my husband's Twitch on Monday, which is today. We're actually recording this right now. Um, he is also going to be on Twitch on and off all day. They're trying to raise money for Wounded Warrior. So you can go check that out. And if you follow us on Twitter and Instagram, you would have seen it anyways. So you should go do that. Yeah, we're doing a correlation with the One Chip Challenge. So, yeah. so far we're... $135 into our goal. The max max goal I have set is $1,000. But um, a buddy of mine and I are doing it together. So together we've raised $135. We hit the $500 mark. We're going to eat one of the hottest chips on the face of the earth. Yeah, it's it's going to melt faces. It's the blue the blue chip. The I can't 2022 what it's one chip challenge. Yeah. So it's pretty hot. And um, it's going to be fun for me to watch him suffer. But anyways... <laughs> All right, so let's hop into it. So, yeah, uh, we left off where we were going to start talking about his killing sprees. I already talked to y'all about how he spent a year pretty much, I'm trying to find, like, perfecting his craft, I guess is what you could say, which sounds really bad, but he spent a year picking up hitchhikers and trying to make sure, you know, certain things that he did that he would be able to kill people. Um, you know, and, and I guess just, I'm losing my words, but anyways, trying, trying to figure out how he could do it and get away with it. That's what I was trying to say. So on May 7th, 1972, Ed starts his killing spree. He would say the reason that he, why he was killing young women was because his, that's what his mother valued. We've already talked about how his mother treated him like crap. Um, would belittle him, call him stupid, ugly, so on and so forth. And so she also worked at the colleges that he would pick up these women at. And um, so he felt like if I killed these women, it would be like killing my mother or getting back at her or something like that. So on this day, he picked up Marianne. Pri- uh, I cannot say her last name. But he picked up 
it's not cash. I know it says cash, but it's not cash. So he picked up Marianne and Annette, Anita, Anita near Berkeley University. When the girls got in the car, he said that he pretended that he, um, that the door wasn't shut. He was like, oh, your door's not shut. Let me lean over and shut it. And we've already talked about how big this guy was. I mean, he was like six, six, nine, almost 300 and something pounds. So he was a big guy. So he just reached over on the passenger side and went to pretend like he was shutting the door better. When he did, he dropped a chapstick down in between the door handle and the, um, the, the door, you mm-hmm. know, like, cause back in the day in those old cars, if you went to open the door, it had to, if something was on the other side of it, it would, it would like jam it. So, yeah. So he wedged something. He in wedged something it. in between it. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, and also remember, like I said, he's been playing this for a year. So he would like do different scenarios and that's how he like got smart, I guess, in order to wedge something in there. What exactly did he do to the victims? That's I'm getting what, there. Okay. <laughs> so they drove around for a little bit and then he didn't take them like where he was supposed to, obviously. Then he took them to a secluded area and he held them by gunpoint. He forced Anita into the trunk and then... He tried to strangle Marianne, but it wasn't working. Instead, he stabbed her multiple times and cut her throat. He then stabbed Anita to death in the back of the trunk. And in an interview, he said that he initially wanted to suffocate both of the women. And like I said, he tried with Marianne. But he basically said in the interview that it was really hard. Like he he underestimated how hard it was to strangle a person to death or suffocate someone. You just hold it till they're... Well, he had the... <laughs> Sit well, there talking like I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. He had the... Um, he had the... Uh, he had a bag, like a plastic bag that he was going to try. But uh, when you suffocate somebody, and I know this because of the because of doing this, when you suffocate someone, just like with BTK, like he thought it was going to be easy, but it wasn't. They go unconscious first. They go unconscious first. Yeah, exactly. It's just like drowning. You'll go unconscious before you actually drown. Yeah. He said that the women also put up a fight, and Marianne actually argued with him in the back of the um, car, which he wasn't expecting somebody to argue back with him, so he was, like, pissed off about that. <laughs> she was like, you can't strangle me. Yeah, probably. You can't do it. <laughs> Probably. I would be. Um, But after he killed them, he dismembered their bodies and kept their heads. Also, and I'll I'll say this, um, he did, like, he did have sex with a lot of the severed heads, and Mm -hmm. we'll talk about that. But, um, yeah, that was, like, one of the things that he did. He kept the heads so he could do that with them. And Ed did say his first two kills, he sat with their heads in his hand, and he couldn't believe what he had done. Not necessarily in a sense of he shouldn't have done it, but, like, he couldn't believe that he finally did it. That's what he was saying. Marianne was 19 and Anita was 18 when they died. He got rid of their bodies. Um, he He buried them in various places. And, of course, he dismembered them, so they were just scattered all around. What were you going to say? I was just wondering if this happened before or after Jeffrey Dahmer. Like, when, when, what year was this? This was before. This is in 1972. Okay. All right. So, there's tons of recordings of Ed Kemper talking about all these murders. Like I said in the first episode, a lot of the things that we talk about come straight from him. Um, but he just kind of... He's very intelligent. Like his IQ is like 150 or something like that. So he's intelligent, but he also just kind of talks in circles, and it's almost like he makes himself try to rationalize what he did. So, anyways, so Marianne's head was eventually found sometime in August, and Anita's remains were never found. Mm. During this time, he um, keep in mind Ed is still going around with his police buddies. Oh, that's something I forgot to mention to you. Yeah friends in the police department. He did. He had friends in the police department. Like we talked in episode one, he would actually go to a place called the jury room, which was like a bar, and he would hang out and drink with them because he wanted to be a police officer, but he was too tall. That's a thing. What? Yeah, it's a thing. You can't be over 6'5". I guess that's... Because you can't can't be too short or too tall to be in the military either, so... 
Which me and Hannah were like, that doesn't make you like. Wouldn't you want to be like a tall, huge police officer? You know? Yeah, they could like they can like point out, hey, there's the bad guy yeah. before anybody else. <laughs> exactly. And they can run really fast. I mean, well, I don't think he could run really fast because he oh. was like he was tall and was like three hundred pounds, like Darth Vader. No, he or was something? almost three hundred pounds. Oh, six. he wasn't super fat, but he was like you just I don't know. I just don't think he could run very fat, fast. Tall, barrel chested guy. <laughs> Um, so this brings us to September 14th. He picked up 15 year old dancer named Aiko Ku. She was hitchhiking because she missed her bus to her dance class. And you might be thinking, why was she that young hitchhiking? You have to remember this is in the seventies. And like we've talked about hitchhiking was like everybody pretty, pretty common. Everybody, everybody hitchhiked. The law back then. Well, hitchhiking, I don't think it was a law. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> being underage and being—you said she was a dancer. Like an she was not an no. She oh. went. To, she was going to ballet class. Oh. You dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. She was a. She was going to ballet class. Let me clarify that for any sh- shitty man out there that thinks, oh, she's an oh, so exotic I'm, dancer. I'm shitty now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Anyways, no, she was going to ballet class. She missed her bus and she saw. Ed and I, I mean, you know, I guess she was hitchhiking, whatever. Um, hitchhiking kind of stopped, I think, in the 90s when everybody was like, you know, if we get in a car with a stranger, they're probably going to kill us. So Ed, of course, drove her to a remote location. She was nervous and he could tell when he got to the lo- to the spot um, that, you know, she was really nervous. So he got out of the car for some reason. I don't know if he was going to go around to her side or whatever. And when he did... He act- I'm not laughing, uh, just this is a funny part, because he accidentally locked himself out of the car. So this 15-year-old girl is in the car by herself. She's locked him out, and he's on the other side. There is a gun under his seat, but she doesn't know that. Unfortunately, he was able to coerce her to open the door. I'm not sure how he managed that, but somehow he convinced her to open the door, and then he murders her. He brutally suffocated her first, and she didn't die immediately. She passed out. While she was passed out and still unconscious um, and alive, he suffocated her again until she stopped breathing. After this is when he performed necrophilia on her body, and then he um, took her body back home. So this is the first time he's decided to take the bodies back to where he was living. He was living with a, um, he was living in an apartment with a roommate. So he took her back home, dismembered her and, um, dumped her body in random places, random locations. So it was harder for the police to, to figure it out. And then I believe he kept her head for a little while. Um, also remember at this time he was talking with different psychiatrists because like I said, in part one, he started, these murders in May and in November was when he got his um, record expunged from when he was 15 because he had to go see psychiatrists and psychologists like multiple ones in order for them to say yes he's fine his record can be expunged and closed expunged for killing folks killing his grandparents yeah when he was 15 so during the time that he's murdering some of these times when he would actually go see the psychiatrist he would have like heads in his in his trunk and they didn't know that. Mm. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing awesome. Everything's fine. <laughs> and eventually, in November, they expunged his record. Not understanding that, you know, he was murdering people. So, um... That's so why you don't pick on kids in school that are 300 pounds and over 6 feet tall. Well, so... Let me explain this because you weren't here for episode 1. Um, he really didn't get picked on in school. His mother picked on him. And that's why he said he did the things he did. But he didn't really get picked on in school. Actually, he was scared of kids in school, even though he was huge. He was scared of kids because he said that he was scared to, like, interact. And and he didn't want them to bully him, is what he said. Like his mom, I guess. So, Ed eventually had to move back in with his mother, unfortunately. And... He did say that this is when the urge to kill got even stronger because his mom would argue with him all the time. But instead of but instead of killing her, 
um, he decided to kill other women. Which I, I call bullshit on that because he had already, you know, killed three women. So, I don't understand. Like, I think that he was going to kill women no matter what is my point. Kill them. So, January 8th, 1973, he picked up his next victim, 19-year-old Cindy Shaw. Just like the other women, he drove her to a, a secluded location. He wasted no time with her, though. He shot her in the head. He... Um, doesn't have an apartment anymore. Like I said, he's sharing a place with his mom. So he Who snuck... On him? Huh? Who picked on him? Yeah. Why didn't he just kill his mom? I mean, that's, that's, that baffles me. We'll, we'll get there. So, um... He sneaks the body back into his mom's house. He then dismembers the body and has sexual relations with the body. Mm. Well, before he dismembers the body. He removed the bullet from her skull. He said it was because in case somebody ever found the head, he would not be traced back. Which sounds like a smart idea. Until you found out that he buried the skull in his backyard, facing up towards his mother's window as like a fuck you. Say that one more time. I I heard you, but I'm just... Yeah. So he, he removed the bullet so it wouldn't be traced back to his gun. Which, okay, sounds pretty intelligent but then he buried the skull in his backyard i don't want people to find out but yeah, i'm gonna I'm bury gonna this head in my backyard in my backyard and he said he placed <laughs> the head mom picked on him <laughs> he said he placed the head facing up towards the window towards his mom's window as like a fuck you type of you know to his mom not that she knew that there was a head buried under the ground but whatever um Cindy's body was actually found, though, um, the next day. Pieces of her, shall I say. And her uh, remains were identified by fingerprints. But you have to remember, all the while, Ed is hanging out with cops. So, not only did they not have any evidence of what happened, but they also were not even looking at him because he's best friends with a cop. This is sad, man. (laughs) Just well, <laughs> yeah, even when he gets arrested, we'll talk about that. A lot of people, like, a lot of the police officers didn't believe what was going on. They were like, no, he, that's not, that, that's not right, you know. you could say it's kind of similar to John Wayne Gacy, because he was, like, yeah, it, well known yeah. in the community. It was, like. He was what, a councilman. And yeah. All and this he other stuff. Did, uh, he did parties as a clown and yeah. shit, so. So, on February 5th, 1973, he picked up 23-year-old Rosalind Thorpe around 8 o'clock. And then Allison Lowe, about 30 minutes later, she was 20. And she actually was getting in the car because she saw Rosalind. And he had not, like, done anything weird at this time. So, you know, she felt comfortable getting in the car. He was actually on the campus at the UC... UCSC campus when he picked up Allison, which was also the same campus that his mom worked at. As soon as they both got in the car, um, so keep in mind, he's on campus and he does this. As soon as they get into the car, he shoots them, he shoots Rosalind in the back of the head with a 22 caliber pistol. And then he shot Allison several times in the back seat she was still alive yeah using a 22 yeah he just shot her it's all like over to various gun. places and um of course rosalind wasn't because she got shot in the back of the head but allison was still alive in the back seat he also shot them on campus while they got in the car when they got in the car and he went through the security guard gate just like nothing had happened like you know they didn't stop him obviously and they didn't i guess they didn't see the body slumped over dead walked in with saw bro saw dude well no he drove through the gate Uh, you know like driving out but there were security guards in the peace yeah (laughs) yeah they didn't like they didn't see anything suspicious in the car i mean back in the day those cars had big windows it's not like you could not see in there there wasn't any tent window tent but the reason why he was able to pick up these women on campus, various campuses also, was because he had taken his mother's um, sticker. Because, you know, she worked on campus. So, he took his mother's sticker. And the college campuses, since he was called the co-ed killer, and he was killing 
majority these college women, they all, all the college campuses are like, do not get in a car with someone that doesn't have a sticker, like a, an aid sticker or like a sticker saying that they're part of the campus. Well, he did. So that's why these women kept getting in the car with him, even though they knew like there's a killer on the loose. Um, yeah, I'm studying human anatomy. I li- I li- I, I'm, I'm going to college here. Stop. So, go get go get whatever he's got. Sorry, our cat has got something messing with my Halloween decor. So <clears throat> he eventually made it to a secluded location with the girls. Though um, he then shot and fatally killed Allison. When Ed talks about this next part, he is very. Did did you get it? Oh. Mm-hmm. When he talks about this next part, though, um, in his in his uh, tapes, because there's like so many tapes you can listen to, um, he's very arrogant about it, and he says that he knew at this moment that he could get away with like pretty much anything. So the, he drives to back to his mother's house with the girls in the trunk, the the dead bodies. He then said that he, standing outside his mom's house, actually it was an apartment complex, so standing outside the apartment complex, knowing that anybody could see him at any moment, he popped the trunk and cut their heads off right there in the middle of, like, the street. And um, he was very arrogant about it because he was like, I knew I could get away with anything because, you know, I knew that anybody could see me, but I didn't care. And I know the blah, police. Blah. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, um... He dumped their bodies about 60 miles away from where he was, though. Ed would say another reason why, um, you know, and I think I talked about this at the beginning, another reason why he would pick up these women was because he hated his mom so much, and he was like, you know, this will teach her if I kill these women. Because some of these women, actually, his mom knew. His mom knew some of these girls, so I think he thought, like, Keep picking on me. I'll show you. Yeah. Instead of, (laughs) you know. Yeah, his relationship with his mom is weird. Um, Went on the titty long enough. (laughs) Something. So, yeah, he's a big narcissist, obviously, as well. Talking about the, um, you know, getting away with everything. Real wolf in sheep's clothing. I'll say that much. So, Ed did say that he was wanting to stop the murders and he wanted to stop killing and the only way he knew that he could do that was if he killed his mother he actually had a woman in his car and then he said some something about i was listening to the interviews something about i didn't want to kill her i knew in that moment that it was time to kill my mom whatever it is time (laughs) yeah (laughs) so on april 20th 1973 Ed's mother, Carnell, comes home from a party and she's like, gets in bed. And then uh, he sneaks into her room later while she's asleep and bludgeons her to death with a claw hammer and then slits her throat with a knife. He then decapitated her and cut off her hands and also ripped out her larynx, which is like... You know, you, what yeah. you talk with. Mm-hmm. So, it was like a... What we're using now. A fuck you to her. Because, you know, he she always used to... Can't say bad mouth to me anymore. Yeah. Even though you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, he tried to... He tried to get rid of it down the garbage disposal. But it didn't work. So, Somebody whatever. Somebody just should have gave Mongo candy. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Shut up. So, in... One of his interviews, Ed talks about killing his mother um he does admit that he decided to have sexual relations with her severed head nasty yep um his own mother's head there's a special there's there's some kind of relation you know it reminds me of uh oh god bates norman bates and his mom you know um a little bit different but yeah she so he does that he also puts her head on a shelf and then throws darts at it nice 
He also kind of starts to weep in his interview, talking about basically he did all, you know, did all this because of his mom. She was such a bitch and she was so evil and and um, that's why he turned out the way that he did. He does say that when she gets home from the party, she was reading a book. This is before he killed her. She was reading a book and she said, um, he came in the room or he walked by her room and she was like, well, I guess you want to talk now. And he was like, no, a good night. And he said, he got, he said that something about the way she said it, I guess, like she never wanted to like have a conversation with him and all this other stuff. And, you know, a lot of people have shitty moms. That doesn't mean they turn out to be serial killers, but whatever. Um, you know, go to therapy, get some help. <laughs> Stop it. Get some help. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, he invites, after this, he actually invites, uh, his mother's best friend, Sarah Hollett, over because he said that he knew he had to make it look like somebody had broke in and killed his mom and not him, mm. which I don't really think anybody would mm. think that. So he was like, I'm going to kill her so that way it can look like they were hanging out and somebody broke in and brutally murdered them. Officer, um, somebody broke in and cut my, wife, my mom's head off and threw dog, darts at it. <laughs> yeah. And because he doesn't do that to. So uh, Sarah, he kills her, he strangles her, and then he has you know, necrophilia, sex with her corpse, and that's it. And then he, like, leaves so um you know he didn't it was definitely not the same kind of attack if you're gonna do that you know it needs it's almost, to it's almost like he killed a lot of these women because it probably reminded him of his mom that's yeah. what it sounds like to me well yeah i mean he that's exactly what it every was every time he killed them he just, just started to just go to town on them yeah I teach you a lesson talk back to me oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's thinking about his mom yeah so after these murders, he got in his car, loaded it down with guns, and headed east. He drove, he made it all the way to Colorado before he actually said he had some sort of epiphany. He needed to turn himself in. So he calls the Santa Cruz Police Department, which is where he's from. And he told them that he was the co-ed killer and where he was. And he was such good friends with the police officers, like I said earlier, that he, like, they thought he was joking. That even the dispatcher was like, you're, you're joking, like, this is a prank, don't call back, like, that's not funny, don't, don't do that. He actually had to call several different times, multiple times, to multiple different people, and be like, no, literally. And he had to tell them, like, different details of the murders, where the bodies could be found, so on and so forth. So, he finally was arrested. Yeah, that's how much they didn't oh, believe yeah? Him. Oh, yeah, bro? You don't think so? Oh, well, this body's at Weston 39th. Okay? Yeah, like, he, <laughs> they did not believe him. It's a him. femur. They thought he was... Jo- well, also, because during this time, he was actually talking to the police about these murders. And they were like, you know, we just don't know who it is. It's crazy. You know, talking about details. Because they were all such good friends. He even... Even one of the... Um, he said he used to get a thrill because sometimes the women that would get in his car, they would talk about, oh my gosh, there's a killer on the loose. I'm so glad that you're here to like help us out because he had that aid sticker on the back of his yeah. car. So yeah, um, nobody, nobody thought it was him. So on April 24th, 1973, he was arrested and admitted to all eight murders um, that he had committed. He wasn't even on the police's radar, like I said. And Ed said that the reason why he turned himself in was because what was making him kill wasn't there anymore. I'm talking about his mom. Like, he didn't have the urge anymore to kill. So, it was all because of his mother. So, once Ed was arrested, he led the police to a couple like for a couple months to different body parts and pieces that he could find that he had dismembered. Um, and there's hours and hours of different tapes you can find all over the internet of him talking. Actually the mind hunter interview, you can, you can see that too. Mm -hmm. Um, and the actor that played him did a really good job sounding just like him. 
So he pleaded innocent by reason of insanity. Um, that was just a way that the, I mean, the, his poor defense attorney didn't really have anything else to do. So it's not like it mattered. Um, you know, what was he going to, what the hell was he going to do? Like, there's no way to defend this guy. But that's what they did. They played insane and it didn't work. Um, I always think it's weird when people do that too. Like you have to be in somewhat insane to kill somebody anyway. So what the hell is the point in pleading that? Um, as long as you, because as long as you, I guess they have to, usually what they do is they try to see if you, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Were conscious enough to know what you were doing. Unless, you know, when you plead insanity. That's how they determine whether or not you really knew what you were doing or not, I guess. So he was, uh, they had a trial. It lasted like five weeks, which I felt was a long time for this kind of trial. Especially when he pled, you know, when, when he uh, admitted to all the crimes. But it only took the jury five hours to deliberate, though. And they came back and found him guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison. And the judge didn't say without the possibility of parole. But he did strongly suggest that he should um, never be out on parole. He actually ser he's serving currently eight life sentences. Ed also was in prison with other murders. Um, a lot of cold-blooded killers, actually. Because the, the place where they sent him was where they had a lot of people. Um... And he's tried to post, uh, not bail, but tried to get parole once, I think back in 2017, I believe. And of course he was denied and he keeps on getting denied. And, um, yeah, he's still alive though. He's still alive and he's an old man now and he's in prison and that's where he'll be for the rest of his life. So this all happened because of his mom, because he's a... I, I would say he's a mama's boy, but not really. But yeah, that's the story of Ed Kemper. <sighs> yeah. So, not as many victims, you know, he didn't have as many victims as I think he could have. Like, if he would have not killed his mom, I feel like he would have kept going. Um, so, I'm not saying it's a good thing he killed his mother, but I, I'm in the long run, I guess, because... There's no telling how many other women he would have murdered and nobody would have really put two and two together, obviously. Um, but there's tons of pictures also of him, like, standing next to police officers and stuff like that. Like, his best friends and stuff like that. And you can see those as well. Um, but, yeah. Hopefully you guys, I won't say enjoyed, but found this interesting. <laughs> um... Next week, we'll have another serial killer. Like I said, we're doing serial killers all month long in October. Um, not sure who we're going to do yet, but if you follow us on Twitter and Instagram, usually on Twitter, we have different polls up. So, and Hannah will be back next week. We didn't do camera today because I just didn't, really didn't feel like being on camera. Um, it's been a long weekend, and uh, but we'll, we'll be back next week on camera. And uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Oh, sorry, been stretching. That's fine. Oh. Okay. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you guys next week. Go ahead and catch up on anything that you have missed. And make sure to listen to part one, because a lot of times, for some reason, I don't understand this, but for some reason, a lot of people listen to part two more than they do part one. I guess y'all are just waiting for the ending. I don't understand it, but whatever. Somebody's going to have to explain that to me. But we'll see you guys next week. Have a great rest of your week. Bye.